some of my notes as I take you through this. So we kind of essentially talked about disease surveillance and how it is the whole idea of quarantines and epidemics we can play. I mean, there's a lot of history to this. Um, uh, surveillance is not new. Um, the oldest form of some surveillance one could uh, put it back to is probably the plague in the 13th and 14th century in Europe where anyone with any flu-like sy symptoms would be distanced and uh, essentially trying to quarantine them. Uh, but at the same time, the idea of quarantine evolved when uh, during the 14th, 15th century, a lot of explorers who were written back from uh, India and their explorations of the Americas. Uh, they would also bring back with them the diseases from those, those regions which are not new to Europe. Like for Europeans, these were new diseases, for example, malaria, some of these yellow fever essentially. Uh, all of these diseases were new, their epidemiology was not known to the medical doctors. So essentially, you have created quarantine as a mechanism for everyone who is coming back to Europe from some of these adventures to be quarantined. Yeah, uh, I think you need to unmute, unmute yourself. Sorry. Okay. And you back from where I started to stop. Uh, so, yeah, essentially, uh, Europeans started this protocol of quarantining people whenever they're coming from some foreign travels, especially from Asia and Africa and other parts of the world. But the modern term of epidemiology as a science or a subject evolves post the cholera outbreak in uh, uh, Soho, London. So, what happens during the cholera outbreak? In, uh, in London is essentially people don't know why cholera is spreading. So you have random people being affected with cholera. By the way, cholera originated in India and then it spread to the rest of the world. So when it reached uh, London, people are not sure how the disease was spreading. So one doctor, uh, John Snow, what he has essentially done is he's mapped every individual cholera outbreak. So by doing so, what he has found out is that uh, the cholera was being spread at regions where there were, were water pumps. Uh, there's a famous map of this called John Snow's map. And there's more research into uh, the idea of data and how uh, statistics have helped with uh, epidemics, solving epidemics, and that starts with John Snow and his map. So he finally figures out that cholera was a waterborne disease, it, it was being spread through the water pumps in and around Soho. So what the next thing they do is they stop these water pumps to stop the outbreak of disease. So this is one of the instances where science in its way has evolved and one could say how statistics were used to understand the uh, how disease spreads. And this is at some level the modern origins of epidemiology as a science. But in terms of uh, public health, right, like even though people understood disease post the plague and you had renaissance and its own effects on the economy, uh, the idea that public health need to be invested on was something that only started in the 17th century. So you have public health committees which were being set up. Uh, the people who were writing books around this and who are trying to ensure that there are district health committees. Uh, while sanitation in, it, in its aspects was something known as back as the uh, Romans, but public health as an investment or an activity was not something older. It only started in the 16th and the 17th centuries. And then post the cholera outbreak in London, you also have some of the uh, laws that have come in place. For example, even the Epidemics Act that's being used in India right now, I think is 1860 or 70s. I believe that's the uh, range when the 
epidemics act was brought in india and that's the same epidemics act that the indian government is using now to control the epidemic in india so the, the modern idea of public health uh, starts again with an epidemic and spread of diseases where uh, somehow doctors were the uh, medieval doctors were able to convince people to start investing and start ensuring that modern aspects of it only takes over after world war 2 i mean there were instances of spread of sexually transmitted diseases during world war 1 and they were actually concerned about it but the only uh, measures to control dixie spread and epidemiology in its truest forms actually started post world war 2 when you have modern institutions like the who being formed and in fact the word disease surveillance was something which was coined in 1962 if i'm not wrong by dr alexander d langmore who was the chief epidemiologist at the us center for disease control and prevention uh, while well, the cdc was back then called a uh, communic communicable disease center now it's something else uh, essentially the idea of uh, surveillance disease surveillance and uh center for disease controls were developed post the world war now when one says disease surveillance or health surveillance it, it's it again it's as i was saying it was coined as a term by by this epidemiologist it was trying to understand how does disease spread which goes back to its roots with cholera in some ways so epidemiologists or epidemiology as a science was trying to use health information trying to understand how disease is spreading trying to understand what is the nature of the disease how does a disease spread whether it's water borne whether it's air borne uh, whether it's sexually transmitted so suppose the 1960s you essentially have uh, an evolving set of healthcare practices modern healthcare practices uh which were looking at prevention of disease prevention of essentially uh, communicable diseases to ensure that they don't turn into an epidemic for example tuberculosis is something of an issue in the late 1980s uh, and 90s you had the issue of aids so people really need to understand how the disease has to spread so without that they were only able to look at each patient individually and they can't do anything once the patient contracts a particular disease when you don't have a cure for it like aids is one of them and what you're witnessing with coronavirus is essentially very similar so you have to stop the transmission of these diseases and the only way to do that is uh, you you understand its epidemiology you try to ensure how uh, it spread and you stop it and the measures that the world is taking right now whether it's lockdowns in india or elsewhere is essentially because people know that uh, coronavirus is an airborne disease it's spreading well it's also spreading from surfaces but essentially it affects your lungs and it's coming because people are people with this disease are coughing and they're spreading those germs now a different uh center for disease controls have approached have taken different approaches to contain this disease the best that's known right now is taiwan uh, and the reason taiwanese uh, center for disease control was able to contain it compared to any of other countries right now is a taiwan is not part of who and when taiwan was uh, affected with the sars uh, virus back in the 90s uh they knew what a healthcare problem could look like and after that they essentially built a, a better center for disease control uh, which is really great because they are not part of who so once they were alerted of the corona virus that's spreading in china uh the cdc in uh taiwan was able to understand the implications of it because of their own past memory with the sars uh, sars virus and they were able to contain it 
and this involved a mix of solutions not necessarily healthcare they were also technological solutions uh, like the, i think uh, the health ministry in taiwan was alerting people where they could go buy masks so that people don't queue up at a single store and spread disease uh well essentially you're providing more information to people and trying to ensure that they are passing through the epidemic then you have south korea uh and the way south korea reacted to this is again amazing which is essentially they started testing heavily that you could get a healthcare test done a coronavirus test done under 5 to 7 minutes and they're quickly able to ramp it up Uh, in terms of the number of uh, coronavirus tests that are being carried out in the world per uh, per million people i think uh, south korea ranks the highest so the kind of responses that you have seen in countries where which were able to contain this virus was essentially primary a health or an epidemiology perspective uh, reaction uh, but what's happening in iran if you take on the contrary was that iran did not inform its people that there was a spread of coronavirus and they continued to hold elections and iran in some ways is a is an authoritarian country i mean the information flow stopped down it's not a democracy i i don't mean any disrespect for the iranian people but the way its governance works is there is secrecy and that secrecy also meant that people did not know that they need to protect themselves and the disease was spreading fast rapidly same but if you look at italy and us their reactions were again different and they're very similar to india in some aspects uh, you had uh, public health officials or the leaders in power uh, actually ignoring what the virus is or how much it could cause an impact you have trump who is saying that oh it's it's nothing it's flu then you have media in the us similarly stating that then you have indian chief ministers who are also looking at it as a normal flu and actually advising that people just take paracetamol to to contain it uh but once they realized what was happening in italy and us i think once a realization kicked in and they realized that the only way to stop this disease spread of disease essentially to ensure a lockdown and we carried that now this is not enough the, the what you essentially need to do is you have to provide a healthcare response that's what every epidemic requires but that's something india hasn't been doing enough we are not testing enough but instead of that what you see happening in india is you are producing a lot of apps which are essentially trying to record where individuals are well if you take the aurogya setu the national covid application it's just one of it one which is major and it's being promoted by the central government but the idea of apps or idea of using geolocation to track uh, spread of diseases again not new we have seen this happen with the ebola crisis in africa during the early uh, 2012 2014 i guess yeah uh, so the concerns around ethics the concerns around how one can use call data records of individuals who have traveled abroad recently and where they have been traveling to and how one can use this data to identify his travel patterns to ensure that people are quarantined now there is a legitimate state use of this data uh it's it would be wrong on my part to say that it's it's surveillance of nature which is harmful no it's just surveillance of nature which is actually useful provided this form of surveillance is actually done with a set of rules and the government is actually transparent about it. the problem and the confusion between epidemic surveillance disease surveillance and the uh, traditional political surveillance is essentially this political surveillance is done to ensure social orders it's done to ensure people do not dissent it stands to ensure regimes do not change and that's what you have intelligence agencies like the intelligence bureau you have law and some of these institutions who are performing these political forms of surveillance 
But health surveillance is different. Health surveillance is targeted. We have individuals who were affected with certain particular disease. And what you are trying to ensure in this is you are trying to trace back how this individual has contracted this disease, where and how. And so to do that, you what you start doing is contact, contact tracing. You start back recreating all of his travel to essentially identify whom all these individuals has contracted with. And you start going back to test them, test these individuals. But if you do not test these individuals, contacting them, trying to identify these people uh, can help, provided that you're ensuring that these people are locked down and monitored. And once they show any form of symptoms, you take back them to the nearest hospital. And the idea is essentially to con contain the spread of disease. Now, the issue with the coronavirus is that it is asymptomatic. It doesn't show you symptoms. Now, so without these tests, uh, one can't do anything about it. So the only reaction that the Indian government can provide to individuals is essentially our central lockdown system. And the healthcare responses that we are doing is less. The doctors do not have the equipment. They are asking for donations uh, to buy some of these equipments. And we have seen uh, two instances in Bombay where hospitals with doctors and nurses have started testing positive. And that's because they do not lack, they lack these equipment and they are unable to save themselves. This is very problematic. So at the same time, uh, the governments across India, like chief, chief ministers and state governments across India are trying to tell us that there is no shortage of personal protective equipment for the doctors. There's no shortage of masks that everything is being done for them. In fact, it's to the point that uh, you have the health updates from the health ministry uh, being censored or controlled that not every journalist is able to ask questions. So you are witnessing a phenomenon where the government's not giving you enough information during an epidemic. Yet at the same time, it's trying to collect as much as information from you through these various corona apps. Uh, and the reason you need uh, an app like uh, Aragya State is essentially because the government does not know where the population is. And this is important. Uh, the last census that happened in India was 2011. And post-2011, you have an increased growth of migration and now you had a reverse migration. Essentially, the governments are uh, flying blind. They have no idea where people are and what they are doing and what sort of economic activity is even possible in this lockdown. So the coronavirus app uh, or the Araki Setu app is not a, a disease surveillance app. It's, it's actually a form of population surveillance app for the government to understand where the population is and for them to actually start making policy decisions which are economic in nature. While at the same time that they are aware that the coronavirus is spreading, they want to minimize the spread, but they still need the economy, economic activities to happen because people are dying even without the virus spreading. Like people are going hungry, there's business activity to stop. So what you're witnessing with the app is essentially is how does the government know where people are and how, how can they channel these people's movement in a, in a very controlled fashion. Uh, in fact, the uh, Arake Setu app will not work if all of us are inside in our houses, right? Like if you're staying with your parents and the only data that this app would record is essentially about you, your parents, or your family. Uh, this app only works, it only works when you're meeting new people and when their phones are on and when they could record uh, GPS data, or the Bluetooth data of these other individuals. So it's essentially to, again, as I was reiterating, to understand how the population is, where it is, and how it's moving. Now, this is deeply problematic because I would have accepted some, some of this 
as a good form of a surveillance health practice, provided there is a lot of transparency in what they're doing. Unfortunately, there's not. And you're witnessing this in times when there is a greater mistrust in the government, specific, specifically with its actions of NRC, NPR, and other, and its stances in the Supreme Court of individuals do not have a fundamental right to privacy. And I do understand uh, that the fundamental right to privacy is not absolute, but and it can be uh, ignored in emergencies. And what we are facing right now is a healthcare emergency. Well, all things said and done, the RGSA to app will not work. And the primary reason for that is because you do not have enough smartphone penetration in the country and you do not have enough internet penetration in the country. So it's an yet another experiment. And it's, and the most important issue I have or one could actually look at this app is it's not being driven by an epidemiologist who understands diseases. It's being pushed by private firms and individuals who are able to uh, collect data, collect data at scale, and it's being pushed by a policy think tank, NPIO, which has no clue and which hasn't produced anything tangible that's great in the past five years. And what you're at the same time witnessing is this is a new epidemic and people do not know how to react to it. But at the same time, they know that the only way, the only care that they can provide to these individuals is essentially give them uh, healthcare support, give them masks, give them ventilators if they are unable to eat, and essentially test them. And we are failing there badly. So, while health surveillance is important, while health surveillance is just, while health surveillance is is not a form of political surveillance that I would oppose. Health surveillance is not the case that's happening in India. Contract tracing is a form of health surveillance. Uh, and even when health surveillance happens, the idea is to actually identify individuals who are being affected because, uh, with the coronavirus. But what you're witnessing, even with the testing, is it's, it's political in nature. It has become political in nature right now with... Uh, uh, the Delhi Nizabuddin issue, where you have as being performed with Muslims uh, because it has become a hotspot. And there is no reason that there are no other hotspots. I mean, if you look at what's happening in Bombay in particular with the uh, hospitals in Bombay and the spread of uh, coronavirus elsewhere, it's important that we test. But while all of this is happening, we see there is a greater mistrust being created by the media, by the government itself, uh, of how they are responding to this crisis, which makes all of this information collection political in nature. And one can't simply assume it's it's actually a just form of data collection because we don't know when the data will be deleted, A, whether an individual can request data deletions. We don't know who to whom the data will be shared, whether it's private firms. And the most important reason why we are witnessing all of this is, uh, according to Chomsky, right, that it's a problem with neoliberalism and capital. We are witnessing that there are a lot of, uh, there's a lack of ventilators, there's a lack of masks, and if you look at the US in particular, uh, similar to India, the US federal states are unable to procure any healthcare equipment because the Trump government is essentially buying all of them, outbidding the states. And states are flying blind. And, and the way states are distributed this equipment by uh, the US uh, state is essentially they give it to a private firm and the private firm will give it to the state which uh, outbids them. I mean, you have a healthcare emergency and there is capitalism at play, uh, which is trying to sell healthcare marks which are needed for states like New York and uh, Massachusetts at the highest price and they are unable to buy them. And you have doctors which are using Yankee ponchos, raincoats, instead of masks and uh, protective equipment. And the only reason that's happening 
is because you let the market do it. You, uh, you always said the market will solve it, and that's what neoliberalism advocates. Except the market has failed, and it's it's that's what is happening in India. You have not spent enough on public healthcare in India, and what you see is instead of healthcare responses in India, we are getting a lot of apps, and apps that are uh, being pushed for surveillance in nature because that's what. Uh, this market has been trained to that you get the data, maybe we can solve it. But you you cannot unless you increase your infra- healthcare infrastructure. Knowing an individual who, who has the coronavirus will not help unless we provide healthcare responses. And that's that's where there is a lot of calls for, across the world that whenever you are building these applications. Uh, you want epidemiologists to be at the lead, but we are not witnessing that in India. In fact, I, I actually do not know any epidemiologist in India right now who is at the center of this uh, fighting the coronavirus. I mean, you do have ICMR, uh, but it's the health ministry which has taken over and which has said ICMR to actually not to release its updates for a while. There were information gaps, so this information disparity and the way things are progressing is very unfortunate and the only way to look at this from a very look at surveillance of this is surveillance and all of this is primarily from as an information society we need information we could process what is good for us and that is being denied to us which is going to further this crisis uh, i'll end it there and i'll take more questions All right, so uh, that was a very wonderful run through. Uh, we would like to take questions on uh, everyone joining in on Facebook and here in Zoom. Uh, if you could just leave your questions and comments in the chat box, maybe we could, uh, we have, we'll have another half an hour for questions. Uh, just to start off the discussion, uh, I, uh, one important thing that uh, you mentioned in your presentation was that this technology can have a kind of uh, democratic potential that this the ongoing uh, crisis. Uh, yet, the way it is being used uh, throws up some important questions about privacy and uh, the way in which this data will be used. Uh, since your work has been around, say, Aadhaar and NCR and the existing data management ecosystem, just to start off the discussion, could you talk a bit about uh, what are the continuities between what we are seeing now, say, with the Arogya Setu app, and the way in which the Indian government, different states, uh, and the state in uh, general, has been uh, setting up a data management ecosystem. Recently, we've been seeing Arvind Kejriwal, for example, he said that uh, Aadhaar and phone numbers will be collected in uh, at large so that we can trace the spread of the virus. So what are different state governments and central governments are acting? So we could talk a bit about these continuities between earlier and now. So the issue with Aadhaar and health records is uh, important. Uh, I mean, it's an epidemic. Uh, emergency measures are required. Uh, and there is no question of that. But uh, the issue is, will it help? I mean, I'm most worried about giving, I will give all of my data. Does it help solve the issue? And what I'm trying to argue is it won't because uh, your targeting mechanisms are flawed in the first place because you're only, you're limited by your tests. You don't have enough test kits. Uh, states like Andhra Pradesh has... 12,000 more test kits, that's it. We don't have enough. We are nowhere close. I mean, if you look at the number of tests being performed in India compared with the rest of the world, we are probably the least. Okay, and and one of the, what epidemiologists, the WHO, their CDCs are explaining to us is the only way to react to this is you test. You test for anyone, anyone with basic symptoms, right? I mean, you have tough, get it tested because we, and it's asymptomatic and that's a major issue. So without getting the test done, one won't know it. So collecting the 
data of individuals is okay so long so you are providing a healthcare response to it. and that's not happening uh and my other issue is what happens to this data post the crisis do you retain it so if you do it you need what under what rules and how will you follow it and helping the state subject what you essentially have is multiple different kinds of responses by different states which is not standardized states like andhra pradesh and telangana and karnataka are doing different kinds of responses versus states like delhi now kerala in itself is good i, I guess kerala is the only model state where it's doing things in, in, in a certain right way and and by don't definition they're not uh, i'm not saying that they're not collecting any data they are okay the the thing to create is trust uh if the government's collecting my information and if you're giving me the trust that you're inducing me the trust that when i contract this disease the government's there to ensure my back it's going to provide the doctors whatever they need it's going to ensure that my health issue is going to solve and they're going to take care of me that's missing and that's one of the reasons why we see a lot of people who have jumped quarantines eat like jumping out of quarantines in hospitals i mean with other and with whatever it is with indians police itself is unable to trace individuals and and that's a problem because and this is happening because of lack of trust Another question. We have a question from Apurva, uh, who's asking, "Do we have any information on the company's behind the Arogya Setu app, and would be useful to have a look at their background?" There are unconfirmed reports, and the source code indicates that it was make my trip or the IP for who was involved, uh, because Niti Ayog was involved in making up this app, so they helped them do it. We do not know. why they do they did it or and what agreements what would they get in return uh, and, and and that's something important right because we know that the government's collecting this data but from there it's a black box we don't know to whom all it's being shared i mean there are few terms and conditions the claim privacy it does exist but then again how do you verify these things and i am questioning this from from a perspective of mistrust uh, and from a perspective of government stances in the past and it will be hard to uh, immediately start trusting the government especially when it's polarizing uh, in, and 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 not providing information in press conferences uh, it will be hard for an individual to actually start trusting some of these measures We have another question from Saudamani, who's asking if you could speak a bit about uh, the implications of this on different states, because uh, uh, the, uh, because as we spoke about, like the need to have uh, uh, trust building measures being brought in by government. What we are seeing is that the trust building exercise so far. Has been that uh, the GST recovery has been delayed uh, as of now, and uh, so these are some indicators of what we can expect. And okay, if we, so if we could just slide us with another question uh, uh, from Apoor, uh, if the government were to put out the codes for Arogya Setu or any other such data collection initiative for public review, would that be a concrete solution, assuming that the network of data being collected is on a massive scale? Okay, so. in terms of the states issue there's an actual concern there right uh, we don't know at what level or uh, center state uh, interactions happening i mean we do know that information is going from the states to the center we don't we do not know how much is coming back but even when it comes back to the states each state is not giving it back enough to the citizens their own citizens their own residents uh so it's it's skewed across the country states like kerala you have pinnari vichayan who is holding press conferences every day and is trying to respond i mean even in telangana i would say the chief minister is trying to do to some extent is doing those press conferences and he was one of the early ones 
who's accepted that we can't provide in healthcare response or healthcare infrastructure is dead for me right and can't handle it. so extend this lockdown uh but the, again telangana has been releasing their head healthcare bulletins like at midnight at 11 11 pm or 12 pm right and not constant in their updates there uh so states are the battlefronts uh, states are limited by their resources states need testing kits states need ppes for their doctors states need masks state needs a lot of healthcare equipment but then again the manufacturing centers of these equipments are skewed across india it's not like every state has this maharashtra has it uh, so that transport of healthcare equipment is important at the same time uh, money right gst uh, the government has uh, created a fund for this that is pmk it's and all of that even there the questions are not on transparency we do not know how much is being distributed to whom or what and that's a concern because you have a lot of population which has reverse migrated to their hometowns and they are not getting enough ration and food and we don't know who's actually getting all of it uh, some states like andhra pradesh are distributing cash to individuals at their doorsteps uh, there are reports of the government central government directly going to do dbt but then again end of the day you if when you're not returning enough money back to state states are unable to provide this extra cash or extra food that they have to or even spend on buying health care equipment uh, this is going to be the case for a while until uh, we have china start exporting its things back i think we may have to import uh, a lot of our uh, health care equipment from china uh, Uh, because that's the only manufacturing center right now, or South Korea. Um, well, India has some; uh, it's clearly not enough. And these whole issues with India exporting medical uh, equipment or uh, medicines to US and other countries, and uh, which is it in itself is a whole new foreign policy issue. While we're ignoring Iran, we are. Uh, with whom we had beautiful relationship for a really long time and we are now trying to send to whatever the us says so that's there and in regards to the app uh will opening up its source code make any difference uh well that's a start uh, but that won't help in value because we don't know what's happening with the data and that's the primary issue i mean a uh, one can actually be trying to reverse engineer the android application and try to understand what it's doing and it's just a data collection app kind of thing uh, but the issue is what's happening to the data and how long will it stay who will have access to it and, and a bunch of new issues so it won't help uh, but it it's it's a it's a good measure if the government can do that uh, to at least start gaining trust Uh, saying that oh we have done this you bastard to be doing something about this okay. uh, so touching on a different aspect of technology in this crisis recently the supreme court has been talking about the spread of misinformation and fake news through whatsapp and uh, that they picked up and causing some kind of hysteria so we have a question from debostam on facebook who's asking how do we understand the issue of misinformation places like whatsapp are fueled with pools of information to without any verification accountability and how do we handle this i mean it's it's very clear it's been very clear and i'll call it out we have known that it was the bjp which has been spreading uh misinformation and uh, disinformation for a while i'm not saying others are it i mean the congress that is every political party is doing it but in respect to and particularly uh, demonizing minorities in the country it was the bjp uh, even now you're seeing Uh, that the bjp is trying to call uh, coronavirus a chinese virus uh, there is uh, a push to create hate or uh, to actually start disowning china i mean what happens when the only place that we can receive any medical equipment is from china in future and the bjp says we don't need it would you let a lot of indians die because you have to take uh, aid from china which you probably might need or would you actually try to educate the masses and say why it happened and it has nothing to do it's not a chinese virus it's a virus and it's uh, viruses have been spreading across the world it's not new and 
and it's important to call out this because we know who are spreading this and the only way to stop this is actually calling it out i mean when will you even do this like after all of this is over next question is from uh, lakshmi she's asking after the lockdown is lifted partially or fully how do you think surveillance will increase and what problems do you see so well everybody now agrees that across the globe that there will be a lot of state interventions the idea of free market is dead uh with whatever they have done to their health systems governments going to have to provide for food health care of a lot of millions billions of people across the world because economic activity across the world world is dead at the same time uh, there is a push for surveillance uh, hungary for example uh, is one of the first countries who has whose parliament has uh, said has given indefinite powers to their president to hold emergency for as long as they want uh, as we have a healthcare emergency a pandemic across the world you see there are these form of uh, responses surveillance responses across the world and this is going to become a norm uh, i mean i don't know how many of you seen this but every police department in the country is now using phones to survey people and where they are assembled uh to be frank they actually need dgca permissions before they are actually going to fly it, but these random uh, drone flights uh it clearly shows that they are not taking those permissions because when you actually take permissions from dgca you have to give a flight plan in this case they are just following people wherever they are running so these are going to stay these are going to be there and we don't have a data protection law in this country even when it comes uh we know that the draft personal data protection bill actually says that the government has all forms of exemptions okay i'm going to take one last question and we'll stop all right i think the last question uh i think mr neville neville describes the situation how after the lockdown was announced the karnataka government released a google map link with the addresses and names of all uh, those who had been identified along with their tra- travel history so that's that's interesting uh, it, it it didn't happen only in karnataka it right? happened in delhi it happened in telangana it happened everywhere right so you have a new form of uh, social class that's emerging uh, it's the resident welfare associations which are trying to become a quasi state body at some levels who are trying to control what a resident does in in their colony now it's these resident welfare associations who were able to procure this information and were sharing it within those whatsapp groups to know if there is any anyone in their uh, society who has a history of foreign travel and they started harassing these individuals uh, trying to lock them up inside their house so that they don't come out uh, which includes going after uh, pilots who were bringing out people back to india and this form of uh, policing uh, model policing at some level is also happening on doctors uh, you see in delhi doctors are being thrown out of their societies because they are attending to patients they are going to hospitals where uh, be patients with coronavirus could come so uh, rws are throwing them out uh, so all of this makes these lists the data lists as dangerous as possible but at the same time uh, there is nothing much that the government's doing the only way to uh, challenge this is essentially start uh, suing those individuals uh, who are actually responsible for those collections the departments which were in charge like in telangana it was the police or in karnataka it was the health department Uh, and it, in karnataka actually they published it themselves right it was not a leak per se they said oh you can go check it out on this website uh, and i think 
those individuals who were on the list need, need to actually go to the court and do it and unfortunately that's not happening and, and it's important people realize that and unless they actually challenge it it won't happen like i do not has i do not have a local standby to approach a court and to fight for them it's it's their issue and they actually have to take that stand to go to a court and that that's how things work in any democracy and if you're not doing that these practices are going to stay right. uh, so i think uh, we'll end it over there uh, thank you so much I mean, there are problems with the technology. It's not a question of the technology itself, but I think uh, from what Shrinivas is saying, that the that the solution lies outside in the society in which it is being applied and the state that we want so, to adopt. Uh, yeah. The Silicon Valley culture has done some improvements to the society. It brought up, it brought us good forms of technology like this own app, but it itself also has issues. Uh, and we we just need to be aware of it, right? That's the issue at play, and we can't just simply assume that anything that's tech is going to solve it. It's clearly not the case. It's a healthcare crisis, and we need healthcare practitioners to respond to it. We can't have IT backend employees reacting to this. And I'll end it there. All right. All right. Thank you, Sunil, for giving uh, us your time today, and that you had an incredibly packed schedule, but. Uh, Thank you for this incredible presentation and the discussion, and for everyone joining in. Uh, hope you keep uh, watching the series, uh, joining us for more discussions in the future. And as we stay in quarantine, maintain the kind of solidarity which we'll be able to uh, find solutions to the problems that we're seeing today. So thank you, everyone, for joining, and stay safe.